All right, you guys, we're going to get started. We way overdue. We had some uh, some other situations come up. We should have been started at 7.30, so we're going to expedite our class by going into prayer, and I'm going to have you to join me in Proverbs chapter 14 tonight, Proverbs 14, as we think about the proposition there relative to our walk as men. I hope that uh, we're able to glean the principle in the proverb I plan on being in the proverb as we'll be re rotating guys from from Saturday to Saturday depending on our schedule I, I hope to be in the proverbs up till summer because of just a number of important nuggets that the proverbs have for us particularly as men seeking to become grounded and purposeful and useful to the Lord. Let's open a word of prayer and get at it. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. We come to you thanking you for another day. We ask that you consecrate this hour of our present study and uh, take our hearts and minds and do with them what only you can do, create order, create beauty, create purpose, fruitfulness, and productivity. We know that we are simply the branches. You are the vine. We can bear no fruit of ourselves. We are in utter and total dependence upon you. We thank you for the seed, the incorruptible seed of Christ, which dwells in us who believe. And we ask that you would water it, nurture it, cultivate it, and may it bear fruit in our lives. You working in us the will and to do of your good pleasure. As we come to you, we confess our sin and rebellion, our disobedience and negligence in every area to which you have called us to walk with you and we acknowledge that we are responsible to love you, responsible to adore you, responsible to walk for lost men and women to declare your glory, even to suffer for your name. We are responsible for all that simply because Christ has obtained an eternal redemption for us that is far beyond any suffering we could even endure down here. No comparison to what he did for us. So grant us grace to walk in faith and to trust you no matter what the assignment is. Again, bless us, bless our brothers that are watching all over the nation and around the world. May this word speak to their heart as well. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 14, 14, we'll spend a little time looking at this and then we'll do some Q&A, <clears throat> fifth quarter stuff to touch our hearts. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14, the text says, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways and a good man <clears throat> shall be satisfied from himself. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. That's the verse I want to lift up out of Proverbs chapter 14. But it's important for you to know that the Proverbs operate out of what we call Hebrew dualisms, where one verse will have what we call in construction a couplet, a couplet. And couplets are just these prose or these statements that are given that are rich and deep in their statements, in their commentary, in their theological implication, but they're said in very short, um, audible fashion. They are audibles, if you play sports, that are short and terse and by design. So again, if you listen to it and catch it before the sound disappears, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Now that pattern is largely what runs through the proverb, not continually, but a lot, doesn't it? This is true, but this is also true. This is happening, but this is also happening. These are called couplets. Now watch how the couplet principle works starting at verse one. Every wise woman buildeth her house. That's one propositional statement with its own inherent meaning and significance. Every wise woman buildeth her house. What is the correlative principle in that statement? A house that's built is only built by a wise woman. A house that's built and built properly is only built by a wise woman. Here is what we call the contrasting couplet, but the foolish woman plucks it down with her hands. 
Now notice that he doesn't use the word woman again. Why? Because the main subject is the woman. And what's in view is a wise woman and a foolish woman, which is a tenor or what we call a theme in the scriptures or we call a pattern in the scriptures, the wise and foolish woman, the wise and foolish men. In fact, in the Friday study, we touched on the wise and the foolish last night, right? Ten virgins. And so we have it here, the contrast between the wise woman and the foolish woman. What the Spirit of God teaches is that the wise woman is engaged in the building of her house while the foolish woman is engaged in the tearing of it down. This is what we call a Hebrew dualism, one, a, a contrasting dualism. One is speaking in the positive, the other is speaking in the negative. Now that will reverse itself in terms of how the prose is constructed. Sometimes it's speaking in the positive first, and sometimes it's speaking in the negative ver first. The verse that we're going to deal with is speaking in the negative first. Look at verse 10, 2. He that walketh in his uprightness does what? Fear the Lord. But he that is perverse in his way does what? Despiseth him. That prose lays out very clearly the attitude and conduct of the believer over against the non-believer. The true believer fears God. The unbeliever despises him. The wise man fears God. The unwise man despises God. Then there's another one too. Look at verse four. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the what? Ox. We could lift that out and deal with the historical, practical, then the redemptive and theological. Every man that has an ox has an ox for purpose. That purpose is generally to trade out the corn in his field in order to provide meat for his family and goods to sell. So the ox serves as the instrument of his business, right? Without his ox, he can't eat. And this is what the first line is saying. Where no oxen are, the cabinet is clean. There is no food in the cabinet. Why is there no food in the cabinet? Because there is no oxen laboring to provide food to put in the cabinet. I.e., food is the byproduct of labor. Food is the byproduct. It's the end result of an arduous labor that started with seed given. That's Isaiah chapter 55, right? As the rain from heaven comes down and as the bread that is given, so the seed has to go in the ground and, and germinate and produce fruit. But that doesn't happen by accident. That's all a consequence of what? Labor. So that proverb is teaching you and I something about the integrity and the importance of laboring. You and I will not see our cabinets filled if we're sitting on our tails. Carry that over into the gospel. How do men and women eat spiritually? How do they feed spiritually? How do they enjoy the bread of life? Unless there is an ox that treads out the corn, and if that's an, there's an ox that treads out the corn, who is he? None other than Jesus Christ. Is he not the real ox that God has used to tread out the corn of the gospel? Christ is the laboring ox that provides the corn for us to feed on, muzzle not the ox that treads out the corn. Is that the principle? Right, so that application is to us too. If we want to own it and ask the real germane question for why we are out tonight, what kind of man am I? What is my calling and purpose? What's my design and scope? How how do I fit into this kingdom scheme and what tools do I need to be able to execute my calling, right? If I were to be apprehended by verse four, I would be told that if I don't find myself laboring, I'm going to be barren when it comes to goods in my cabinet. As Solomon often said in the book of Proverbs, the talk of the lips tendeth only to poverty, but there is profit in all labor. Now, what you and I are about to deal with in Proverbs chapter 14, 14 is a very powerful concept that you and I want to be able to have our souls uh, brought into subjection to and the question uh, raised in our conscience, can we bear record with verse 14 of chapter 14 in the positive light? Because that's really our exhortation tonight. Here it is. Proverbs 14, 14, part B. A good man shall be satisfied where? 
from himself. Does anybody else have a different translation? <clears throat> If, if your translation is like mine, then yours says, a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Tim, what do you have? From above? Okay, and so that's really uh, just kind of a poor translation, but um, that is what we would call a loose translation. If you'll notice in your outline as we move into it, the first thing I have in our outline is what? To, uh, basically a sub point under our outline filled or satisfied and the two questions that come out of Proverbs 14 is this why is a hypocrite filled with his own ways because isn't that what it says why is a hypocrite filled with his own ways and how is a good man satisfied where from himself exactly now I'm going to show you why those two questions emerge by giving you what's in your outline almost a literal rendering of the Hebrew. In your outline it says, of his own ways shall he be filled, shall, shall be filled the backslider in heart. Then finally what? Also the good man. Do you see it? This is almost a literal Hebrew translation, which means this, the few nouns and verbs and prepositions in this particular verse gave the translators a difficult time in translating. They had to use a little bit of liberty in being able to frame this to make it say what we have in the English. In the Hebrew, which as you know, starts from right to left, the way it starts off in the Hebrew is of his own ways, which is a critical component to our observation. Of his own ways shall be filled, watch this, the backslider in heart, also the good man. Also the good man. So if we were to derive a conclusion based upon that proposition, what it's actually saying is every man shall reap what he sows. Can you guys see that? Every man shall reap what he sows. But where you and I want to go with this tonight is to understand the distinction between what a distinction between what the hypocrite reaps and what the good man reaps. And then we want to be careful to understand how is it that a good man can be filled or satisfied rather, because that's the literal Hebrew rendering, from himself. From himself. So let's just start working through. This is fairly going to be fairly quick and fairly easy. It's not too, not too difficult to, to understand. Let me see here if I have the uh, same one that you do. I want to make sure that I do. Um, did we take all the, here we go. I want to make sure that we run this together. So in the first thought, here's what we have. If we understand that of his own ways shall be filled the backslider and heart also the good man, the singular principle here is that man will always and only receive from what he truly is where? In his heart, right, because God judges the what? Right, so, so this is an issue of, of reaping, reaping. This is an issue of reaping, and that's why several of the verses that we saw in um, the earlier parts of Proverbs 14 uh, underscore that. And as I just stated out of the book of Galatians and other, where, other places, it will show us that too. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also what? Look at Proverbs chapter 24, verse 7 for a moment, and let's continue to nurture that thought. Proverbs 24, verse 7. Notice what it says. Uh, let me see, is that the one that I want? Proverbs 24, 7, are we there? Wisdom is too high for a fool. He openeth not his mouth in the gate. That's not the verse that I want. That is not the verse that I want. So leave that alone. Um, Galatians chapter 6 will su suffice for us. Move to the next thought. This is an issue of the heart. Proverbs 4.23. Look at Proverbs 4.23. This is an issue of the heart. What we're dealing with in Proverbs 14.14 14 is an issue of the heart. And so we read in Proverbs 4.23 these words. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of what? 
Right. And then from here, what Solomon says under this exhortation to guard your heart is put away from you a forward mouth and perverse lips put far from you. In other words, control your tongue. Why control your tongue? Because your tongue is attached to your heart. Right. So now this is going to be very important, brethren, as we're talking about discerning and developing uh, character in our own life. If, if I am going to be a man whose life matters for the kingdom, I've got to understand the value of my words. If I'm going to be somebody for whom the kingdom of God matters, I've got to understand the value of my words. I've got to know that my words will play a role in cultivating developing and producing fruit or withering the vine and destroying the harvest if my words are not taken seriously. I've got to know that. I've got to know that I am not free from the consequences of how I talk. Are you guys listening to me? And I mean in every aspect of life. Grasp the metaphor. When you open your mouth, you are sowing some kind of seed. You are making some kind of impact. You are imposing some kind of proposition on the mind of those to whom you're talking. You're either imposing legalism and self-righteousness, which brings bondage and narcissistic consequences, or you are uh, promoting grace and mercy, which produces liberty, authenticity, and therefore an atmosphere of growth, particularly in the context of error and falsehood or sinfulness, where an individual needs to be uh, free to recognize that they are not walking right with God. Grace and mercy is going to give them a platform to acknowledge that. Is that true? But if my words are careless, if I am saying things that do not take into account the principle of consequences, I can actually destroy a lot of good with my words. All right. So now if my goal is to identify with the uh, latter proposition in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14b, if I want to identify with the good man, and that's where we're going, if I'm going to identify with the good man, do I not really need to be very careful about my words? Right. Of course, if you know anything about the comparison between the Old Testament and the New Testament, are the abundance of the heart that the mouth speak. Right? And so I need to know that if I'm going to actually seek to acquire those attributes and characteristics that constitute being a good man, I've got to watch my mouth. Now, we've already learned as we're going through the book of James under the construct of maturity in Christ that there are three men in James that are our model. Is that right? James chapter 1, 12, he's called the blessed man. James chapter 3, verse 1, he's called the perfect or mature man. Now, he's mature and perfect because he can control his what? Tongue. And then James chapter 5, verse 16, he's the praying man whose prayers effectually availeth because he has a contact with God. So the kind of man I want to be is not only the man that's blessed because I overcome trials, not only the man that's mature because I can guard my tongue, but also the man that when he goes to the throne of grace and calls on God, God hears him. That's the kind of man I want to be. Of course, all three of those men correspond to one man, and that's who? Christ. But aren't you and I called to Christ? Is not Christ our ultimate mentor? Is he not our ultimate model? Is not he the maximum icon of God? Is not he the ultimate man? Of course he is. And we've been called to that. So there's an area that we want to apprehend here as we work our way through our text. And that is we want to make sure that we are men who regard the value and quality of our words. You guys got that? If I'm going to grow up in Christ, I'm going to be careful about how I talk. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to be perfect at it, but I can become better at it. Am I making some sense? 
So it's really critical that we understand that. So now, deal, dealing therefore with uh, the rest of this, what we call practical application of guarding the heart in Proverbs chapter 423, he says, put away from you a forward mouth, a perverse lip, put far from you. Let your eyes look right on and let your eyelids look straight forward. This here is also the metaphor of discipline. Remember I talked to you about the puppy dog in the master's hand that the puppy dog is an untrained dog, and while he's walking with the master, he's looking at everything and distracted by everything that moves, right? He's definitely not looking straight forward like his master because he's not disciplined. But once he's disciplined, he's only concerned with the course of his master. As his master goes straight, he goes straight. As his master turns left, he turns left. As his master turns right, he turns right. We know that that is a disciplined dog, is he not? That's a mature dog. And that's the concept that Christ taught in Matthew 16 concerning the servant cannot be greater than the master. The disciple cannot be greater than the teacher. At best, he can be like him. And we certainly want to be like Christ, don't we? So we want God to discipline us in a way that as the big will and the little will of Ezekiel chapter 1 corresponds to the father and the son, so that the son never did anything that the father didn't tell him to do, I want to be able to do what Christ tells me to do. Am I making sense? Right, so this is where the proverb is going for us as we contemplate the latter part of first ver uh, verse 14 uh, B in chapter 14, but let's just close out with chapter 4's exhortation on a practical level because what he first started dealing with is our mouth in verse 24. Then he started dealing with our eyes, the wandering eyes. When the eyes are wandering, that means you are not fixed on your goal. Now he's dealing with our feet. Look at verse 25, verse 26. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be what? See it? So your heart, your eyes, your feet. And then he says in verse 27, turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove your foot from evil. Here's a call to discipline, structure, singularity, focus of mind. And you would read this in the book of Isaiah concerning Christ, that his face was set like a flint. That's how Christ was, set like a flint. And you know that by the totality of his life because you never found Christ meandering, did you? When you go through the Gospels, Christ is not just chilling and wasting time. He was always about his father's business. And that's the kind of mindset that you and I want because we don't want the days of our lives to expire and we become old and realize that we have dissipated a lot of energy and wasteless banter. Now let's go back to our proverb and work through our outline. I think you're ready now. Proverbs 14, 14, which I want to uh, press into your heart and mind and thought for this week and next week. Proverbs 14, 14. A hypocrite will be filled with his own ways and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. The literal translation of his own ways shall he be filled, the backslider in heart, also the good man. Now, what is a hypocrite or who is the hypocrite? Do you guys have that in your outline? Who is the hypocrite? So we got five sub points we want to deal with. One, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six sub points that I want to deal with. The first one is the hypocrite is a person who hides from God and he is a lover of darkness. So now what's really important about what we're about to deal with here is that we're going to have biblically defined for us the conduct and, and attitude and motive of the hypocrite. We just want to know because that term is used sparsely in the Old Testament and it's used prominently in the New Testament. Where? In the Gospels. It was the one negative appellation, we would call it a pejorative, that Christ used for the Pharisees. It was the one constant pejorative that Christ used for the Pharisees. Uh, uh, Elder Angelo, can you do me a favor? Can you cut that AC on over in that corner so we can get some circulation? You'll find the uh, monitor under the bottom of the seat. The word hypocrite here is to be understood as someone who is appearing to be something that they are not. In the New Testament, hypocritos is the term for being an actor, and those actors in early ancient Greece would wear masks, and they would act behind the mask, and when the show was over, they would be who they really are. In the context in which scripture would yield the idea of the hypocrite, 
It would be a person who pretends to know God, love God, walk with God, but in fact doesn't know God at all, doesn't walk with God, and doesn't love God. So I'm going to share with you two verses that would expose the hypocrite for us. The first is Job chapter 13, verse 16. Now I want you to mark this. I remember years ago when I began to meditate upon the term hypocrite, particularly coming out of the Psalms, because the Psalms does talk about the hypocrite. hypocrite. And frequently in my earlier years, one of the things I wanted to know was, who is this character called the hypocrite in the scriptures? Because I was frequently under the misnomer that the hypocrite and the wicked were never the church folk. When I first started studying scripture, I made a false dichotomy between people who were in church and people who were out of the church. I thought all the wicked and the ungodly were those people who never went to church and lived outside of the church and that the righteous and the godly were those who were in the church. That's how I thought before God revealed his glory to me and let me know that the major context in which God is cutting the lights on in terms of false and true is in the church and that he's dealing largely with the covenant people of God. And so in our context, here's what it says, verse 16. He also shall be, I'm sorry, this is Job chapter 13, verse what, 17? Well, Job 13, 16, notice what it says. He shall be my salvation, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. Do you see it? So if you start back at verse 15, this is a famous chapter, chapter 13, where Job is going through a lot of trouble. And notice his confession in verse 15. Though he slay me, yet will I what? But I will maintain my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation. Job is rejoicing in the fact that God's going to deliver him from his troubles. And here's his confidence, because he's actually calling on God in his trouble. He's actually pursuing God in his trouble. He's actually drawing near to God and putting forth his pleas. Yes, he puts forth his complaints, but he's coming to God. Now, here's what he says. A hypocrite doesn't do what I do. Do you see? A hypocrite doesn't come to God in trouble. A hypocrite does not call upon God when troubles strike his life. A hypocrite tries to work his own problems out by his own machinations. A hypocrite does not have a relationship with God to go to God. What Job is saying to the confidence of his own soul and to those three men that are about him is, I go to God in my troubles because God is the only one that can help me. A hypocrite doesn't do this. Now, what is he saying? He's speaking to his three friends because his three friends have already assailed him with being a hypocrite for several chapters now. Job says, if I were a hypocrite, I'd be working this out myself because the hypocrite only pretends to call on God. Remember what Matthew chapter 15 said? Jesus said, you hypocrites, with your mouths you do show much love, but your hearts are far from God. Got it? Which means this, <clears throat> that around the area of coming to God is not a matter of words, it's a matter of the heart. Around the matter of coming to God is not so much you vocalizing or verbalizing your needs, it's a matter of you yielding your heart to God in authenticity and earnestness that you are broken and that your situation cannot be fixed if God doesn't help you. It has to be heart language. Are you with me so far? Right, and so the, <clears throat> what is a hypocrite? He's one that hides from God. Here's another one. Here's another one. It's John chapter 3, verse 19. I quote it frequently. If you can pull that up, this is one that you should learn by heart as well. John three nineteen, And this is the condemnation of the world, that light is coming to the world. Who is that light? Christ. What is that light? The word of God is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light. See it? So there's a natural, there's not a natural disposition towards God on the part of the unregenerate. They actually love affectionately the dark realm. Now, if they love darkness, can they also love God? Because God is the ultimate antithesis of darkness, right? If God is light and I love darkness, I cannot love God. <clears throat> If men love darkness rather than light, they cannot love anything about God because there is no darkness in God at all. Is that true? So now, if, if the true God is pure, unadulterated, unmitigated light, everything about him is light, 
even when the ungodly or the hypocrite even thinks about God, he shudders because he has no desire for that light to penetrate his life. So what we have in our opening statement concerning Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14, is what we would call in Romans chapter 8, the carnal mind is enmity against God. The carnal-minded man has an aversion to the things of God. You guys follow that? All right. Going back to our text, because we're working through our text, Proverbs 14, 14. So the next thing we add is, he is the man who hides his sins where? Do you guys see that in your outline? This is another verse you want to learn. The hypocrite is the man that hides his sins in his bosom. This is the book of Job chapter 31, 33. Watch this, Job 31, 33. So now let's, we're working on part A so that when we get to part B, we won't be lacking in Proverbs 14, 14. Job chapter 31, verse 33. Are we there? So now notice the language. I'm going to start at verse 31. If... The men of my tabernacle said not, all that we had of his flesh, we cannot be satisfied. The stranger did not lodge in the street, but I opened my doors to the travelers. This is Job in chapter 31, speaking during the days when the Spirit of God had so endowed his life. Read that chapter in your own time. It is a fascinating expose of the grace of God that was in Job's life and the anointing of God was on Job's life so powerful that Job was demonstrating the power of God's favor by doing good to all those that were about him. That's one of the evidences of a vital faith as we're going to learn tomorrow. Vital saving faith does not operate barrenly or emptily and it is not dead. When God actually anoints you and empowers you, he empowers you to make an impact in people's lives. And Job here is recounting how that in the days of his youth, when the power of God was upon him in such a mighty fashion, he was a blessing to everyone around him. And this is where he's describing in verse 32, the stranger did not lodge in the street. Why? Because he cared enough about the stranger to help get him off the street. As we learned last Sunday, faith must care about people. He goes on to say, but I opened my doors to the traveler. He says, if I cover my transgressions, as who? By hiding my iniquity, where? In my bosom. Do you see it? If I cover my transgressions, as Adam, by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, did I fear a great multitude, or did the contempt of families terrify me that I kept silence and went not out of the door? Whoa! Now mark what he's saying here. When the hypocrite is operating out of the duplicity of pretending to be something that he's not, he does not possess the gift of boldness, not only to practice love towards those who need it, but stand against his assailants when they try to oppose the godly principle in his life. Do you notice that? Do you notice what he's saying? He says, now, if I was like Adam, and what did Adam do? Didn't he hide his sin in his bosom? Didn't Eve and Adam and Eve hide their sin in their bosom? Didn't they, the moment upon transgressing, run and hide? Put on fig leaves, hide behind the trees. They hid their sin in their bosom. They certainly didn't confess their sins, did they? So uh, evident, evidently, in that early culture of, of uh, Job, along with Abraham and others, mark this now, they had a sound anthropology. They had a very clear understanding of the fall of man, that mankind after the fall has a sinful tendency to run from God, not to God. That mankind after the fall does not look for God, he hides from God. And we hold to a sound biblical theology that says we can't come to God unless God draws us. We won't expose ourselves to God unless God comes to us in mercy and grace. We won't tell the truth about our iniquity until God gives us a reason to tell the truth about our iniquity. Is that true? Right. So we deny and we defy those who say that there are people all over the world looking for God. No one's looking for God until God gives them a platform and a premise to do so. All of us are hiding from God. The tragedy, however, is when you pretend like you're looking for God. And in fact, you are hiding behind the fig leaves of your own self-righteousness. 
Now, what we have to do here with the hypocrite who is filled with his own ways is understand that the consequence of his actions leads to the fruit in his life. Because that's the first line of Proverbs 14, 14, right? The hypocrite will be filled with his own ways. If he sows darkness, he's going to reap darkness. If he sows hypocrisy, he's going to reap hypocrisy. And the text would imply here in verse 14 that if Job had lived a hypocritical life, because he was a wealthy man, he was a powerful man, he was a prestigious man, God called him the most perfect man in all the East, and you know people were jealous of him, and what he was saying is, if I lived a hypocritical life before God, I wouldn't have any power to stand up against my enemies and tell the truth. It's one of the things that happens when you are, by God's grace, walking in the integrity of the gospel. When your enemies come after you, you can stand. When your foes assail you with allegations that you, are, that you know are not true, you can tell them you're a liar. You don't know you have taken things and distorted them. You have misinterpreted things for your own goals and objectives. I know where I stand with God. This is what Job is underscoring in our text here in verse uh, 32. Notice again, this, uh, verse 33. If I cover my transgressions as Adam did by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, verse 34, then I would fear a great multitude. This here is a perfect portfolio for politicians isn't it? Politicians stick their finger in the wind, determine what the consensus is, and then goes the way of the consensus. They put on a facade that there's something, but really what dictates and determines their course of actions is what people think versus what God thinks. Did I fear the great multitude or did the contempt of what? Families terrify me. Do you guys see that? Watch this now, this is an amazing thing because you must admit with me that Job is an eminent type of who? That's exactly right. Did Christ have to deal with the antagonism of the multitude? Did Christ have to deal with family members contempting him? Of course he did. This is why this is richly Christocentric. This is why Christ said, if you're going, if you're going to join me, brother, you're going to have to take the same hits I do because they didn't understand me, they won't understand you. What Job is doing here is explaining to him what you and I are going to ultimately understand that when it comes to a good man, he has a component with him and in him that brings satisfaction, though the outward circumstances may be very bad. Y'all following me? So he goes on to say, just to wrap it up, oh, <clears throat> he says, I'm sorry, let me finish this last line. He says, did I keep silent? And did I not go out do and would I not go out of the doors? Here he has a picture of him hiding in his house, right? Not wanting to face the public, not wanting to face the conflict and the contention. Not only is he not not actually uh, speaking up, but he's hiding in his house and cowering from the antagonism. This is the last thing that a true prophet would be. And Job was a prophet. Let's move forward. So who is a hypocrite? He's one that hides from God. He's a lover of darkness. He's the man who hides his sin in his bosom, and he suffers a lack of boldness. Remember, the wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a what? Right. But fourthly, he is a liar and a deceiver, right? Because he pretends to know God, but in fact, we know he doesn't. And this is where Christ said in Matthew chapter 6, I'm just going to run through a few verses there. Matthew 6, verse 2, 5, and 16, he tells the disciples, do not be like the hypocrites. Because they love to make big fancy prayers in public. They like to talk about how much money they give. They like to make a fair show in the flesh so that they can get the approval of men. He says, do not be like them. So as you and I are working on the antithesis of being, look at it. Therefore, when you go do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets that they may have glory of what? Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Look at verse five, look at verse five, six, uh, five. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the corners of the street that they may what? Be seen of men. Verily they have their reward. And look again at our final verse in our outline, verse 16, Matthew 6, 16. 
Here it is. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. One of the revolutionary uh, protocols that a gospel man or a woman must obtain is the principle that you are not doing things to be seen of men. One of the fundamental revolutionary principles that's going to help you avoid the superficiality of outward applause is that you cannot be doing what you do in order to receive the approval of men. There must be a direct one-to-one -one radical relationship between you and Christ that is so exclusive that if God were pleased to never let anything that you do be seen by anyone, you have to be satisfied with that. Did that make sense? Really, actually, what you and I are getting at, which is a critical aspect of speculation and investigation of doctrinal truth, is what might be called in the colloquialism, the root of the matter. We're getting at the root of the matter because the root of the matter is really where we have to do the proper and careful analysis. Sub point E, not only is he a liar and deceiver, he's a murderer, isn't he? I love this, Proverbs chapter 11, nine. We can get back to the Proverbs. Proverbs 11, nine. Listen to what this says. In Proverbs chapter 11, nine, it says, a hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his what? A hypocrite with his mouth does what? Destroys his neighbor. <clears throat> See it? Well, let's tie together <clears throat> the, the, the larger redemptive paradigm of which every sound exegetical expositor must know is critical to drawing any gospel conclusion. If we've already identified that the word hypocrite has been used most prominently out of all the scriptures in the gospels, and that largely the hypocrites have been stingingly condemned by Christ as being the rulers. Does this passage not then underscore that it was the rulers who killed the one neighbor and that neighbor was Christ? Got it? Do you see it? That one neighbor that they destroyed was Christ because what did he do? He pulled the curtains back and exposed them of their hypocrisy. And remember the hypocrite doesn't love to dwell with God. So in terms of a larger redemptive interpretation here, we have a passage that prophesies the crucifixion of Christ by the rulers. Is that, is that a legitimate observation? Absolutely, and it ought to be whenever you and I are interpreting scripture, we ought to always want to see Christ in it. Latter line. But through knowledge shall the just be what? Delivered. That's the last line of that verse. This is a prose again, and this is just something for you to get. I'll tell you what you, you need to do. If you ever are struggling with what to read on any given day, immediately stop that nonsense and go to the Proverbs. As soon as your mind goes, oh, I don't know what to read, rebuke yourself. And immediately just throw the book open to the Proverbs anywhere and let your soul just fall on any text in the proverb and sit right there until that text comes alive and metabolizes in your heart and shows you some practical principle because there's just no way you're not going to benefit from listening to the proverb every day. Oh, I don't know what to read. I rebuke you. Proverbs. Where? Anywhere. Just open it like the pagans do. Throw your Bible up in the air and open it to the Proverbs. Wherever it lands, look on that page and say, God, speak to me. Because the Proverbs is for us, the young men, to give them discernment, to give them subtlety, to give them discretion, to help them understand right decision making, to build and inculcate the fear of the Lord, right? Proverbs are wonderful. You know how you have some, I was getting this from one of our younger brothers on our Wednesday night study. He was asking the classical question. Man, how do I get my study time in when I'm working all day long? He's a teacher. And he says, Pastor, I really struggle with getting my reading time in. I got that. We're all hustling, aren't we? And one of the things we will find ourselves challenged with is one-to-one -one with God, position number one. That's what I'm going to call it for a while now, okay? I'm going to call it position number one. And as soon as you hear position number one, what am I talking about? Bible reading. That's what I'm calling it, Bible reading. And we will do a bunch of other things 
And we will even do some religious things like listen, listening to good sermons and exposition and all that's good. Don't, don't get me wrong. God works through that powerfully. But position number one is your time face to face with God's word. Even if it's for five minutes, I, I promise you, if you and I can do five minutes a day. Now, right now, if your soul is effete and weak spiritually, five minutes is too much for you. But once you develop a pattern and priority, you'll realize that five minutes is no time. Five minutes is opening up the Proverbs and reading it with a little bit of carefulness that will consummate maybe one chapter or even a half a chapter. When you just take your time and read it with some pondering and contemplation, five minutes is a half a chapter. Close that book and do what the clean animals do. What do they do? Chew the cud. Just chew the cud on that word all day long. Just chew the cud. That's what the clean animals do, right? They chew the cud. They chew it and chew it and chew it and thank God for that word for the day. It doesn't actually have to have any profound revelation in it because from a disposition of honor, you're glad that God has spoken to you through his word. What I want to do is meditate on it enough for it to actually be something that I am at least in part memorizing so that it will come back in time where I need to make an application. Thy word have I hid it in my heart that I might not sin against you. So if I am meditating upon God's word, Psalm 1 verse 1, then it's more likely to come back when I need it. Is that true? Right, so, and, and, and I'm getting at, don't, don't take larger bite size of scripture than you can handle because the Proverbs will say it in Proverbs 25 and other places. You're going to throw up as a consequence of excess that which is good. Am I making some sense there too? But if we want to advance this year as men of faith and mature in our walk with God, we've got to make sure that that face-to-face -face time is not diminished by other potentially good things. Because the enemy would love to cause you to have little or no face time with God by telling you that you're doing other things that are good, like paying your bills and taking care of your family, et cetera. All that's good, but it's evil if it takes you away from the scriptures. Is that true? It's evil. And I'll tell you, as I've learned over 30 something years now, that God is really not calling you and I to a monastic approach to scripture where we're studying and meditating on scripture all day long to a lack of other practical responsibilities in life. He has never called us to that. When he called Adam and Eve to the work, it was the work of tilling the ground and provi providing food and no nurturing and cultivating and dividing the land and dominating the world in conjunction with their walk with God. So we were already multitasking in the garden. So we can multitask, brothers, we can. We can work and enjoy work. I was telling the young men, I said, now, and I was glad that Michael was there because Michael was teaching this Wednesday, but what Michael said, what I said to him when Michael walked in, I said, listen, just get in our app because our, our, our phone app keeps you going. Somebody's going to quote a verse to you and it's largely out of the Proverbs or somewhere else out of the Psalms. And if you're in with the, with the phone apps with us, you're in on the dialogue, on the meditation for the day. Boom, somebody's giving it to you. And this is what I love about technology. So even before I get up, coach, hitting me, bleh, bleh. okay, I got a revelation at 5.15 in the morning from the coach. Flip it over, look at it, say, that's sweet. I got something to meditate on for the day. What a blessing, because long ago that wasn't available, was it? What a blessing to have somebody else that labors and we get to enter into that labor. And then the next thing you know, over the course of that whole day, people are responding to that proverb. And the next thing you know, you got four, five, six, seven brothers going, amen, or saying, here's a word on top of that, or somebody expanding on that. That's what the brotherhood should be doing all the time. And there is therefore no excuse for us not to be doing FaceTime. That may be the very verse that God is going to use through you to deliver somebody that day. You guys understand what I'm saying? Okay, good. So let's work towards our last one. Our last one is uh, of himself, of himself. The hypocrite 
hides from God. The hypocrite is the man who hides his sin in his own bosom. The hypocrite, I, I forgot to deal with verse C, but it's really a fundamental principle. He nurtures that re rebellion to full maturity and it ends up it ends up being and, and ends up being slain by it. That's James 1, 14 and 15. You know it. Every man is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. And when uh, sin has conceived, it brings forth death, right? When it has matured, it brings forth death. So you and I, if we were operating out of the principle of the hypocrite, we are in a self-destructive mode. A self-destructive mode. But the final one, which is going to move us into our second leg, which I'm going to just open up today, open up today, and then press into more fully next week, is that the hypocrite is destroyed of himself, of himself, of himself, of himself. And that's what we see as well. Uh, the hypocrite is destroyed of himself. Looking now at Matthew chapter 24, verse 51, Matthew 24, verse 51, where Christ speaks of this. This is the sad eschatological conclusion and estimation of the hypocrite. Matthew chapter um, 25, verse 51. Now, 24, verse 51, this is uh, the concluding the uh, era of judgment. And, and, he, and this is a powerful one, too, because this one deals with the two servants the obedient servant and the disobedient servant. Let me see if I can make this work. I'm going to start at verse 45. Are you there? In fact, let me start at verse 44 because it sets the context of the return of Christ, which we talked about last night. Whether you know it or not, one of the other compelling principles that should drive you in your pursuit of maturity in Christ is the fact that Christ is returning again. This is a secret that the early church understood that allowed them to do the kind of works that saw to it that the gospel spread around the world. This fundamental tenet of the gospel has been lost in our generation. And here's the reason why. Because we have too many opportunities to prosper materially, to really and sincerely want Christ to come back yesterday. Are you with me? And, and, and I love the fact, I'm, 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 I'm in a quandary, brethren. I'm in a quandary. I'll tell you why. I love the fact that God saved me in the 20th century and is using me both in the 20th and the 21st century. I'm glad to be an American. <clears throat> I'm glad to be uh, a person who has grown up largely on the West Coast. I'm glad to be in California. I'm glad to live in the cultural context in my day. If we had the cameras on us, you would see that we are a multi-ethnic group in here right now. That's not always the case, and largely, it's never the case. But I get to minister and have ministered from the beginning of my ministry to a multi-ethnic brotherhood. And that, that weighs as an advantage when I go around the world. When I go to Mexico, I have to deal with all my Latino brothers. When I go to Africa, I got to deal with all my African brothers. When I go to Europe somewhere, I got to deal with my European brothers. What is your church like? Because they would all be assuming that the church that I pastor is totally African-American. That's a flawed assumption. That's a flawed assumption. So we have the rich diversity that uh, West Coast and uh, American culture affords us, which really should be taken advantage of in terms of shaping our ability to influence with people with the gospel. You benefit who are non-black from a black pastor. Did you guys get that? I benefit from you not being black because your characteristics and traits augment me. Are you guys understanding what I'm saying? So we benefit from the diversity versus everything being monocentric. Because when a thing is monocentric, and this is why Christ was such a problem for his own people. When a thing is monocentric, it's myopic. It's tunnel visioned. It loses the peripheral glory that the gospel calls us to. It cannot contain the mass nature of God's thoughts and the depths and the riches and the fullness of God's purpose because it's too narrow. I saw that growing up in ministry, by the way. So frequently in my early days, I was, I was part of ministries where the churches were much smaller, 40, 50 in their size, and monoethnic. 
And one of the things that became clear to me was that in a smaller monoethnic context, you always adjust your world to your context. And when you adjust your world to your context, you create a parallel world that in many cases does not correspond to the real world. Am I making some sense? And this is what we talk about being too small minded when you think that your congregation encompasses or represents the totality of the whole scope of the redemptive agenda. When Revelation chapter five, verse nine tells me out of every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue has God redeemed the people for himself to the praise and glory of his great name through the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. That's a phenomenal worship service right there. Is that a phenomenal worship service? That's a phenomenal worship service right there. And we should all be playing a role in facilitating that. And we get to do that in the West Coast because we live in such a diverse uh, culture that it allows for that. I'm preparing to move into uh, the good man uh, thoughts before we shut it down at nine. Now notice what it says in verse 44. Therefore, be ye also ready. Do you see it? For in such an hour as you think not, the son of man is coming. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? That's our topic tonight in conjunction with being a good man, right? Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Watch this now. Who is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made him ruler over his household to give them meat in what? Due season. This is a description of his calling as a servant. What does he do? He ministers to his Lord's household meat in its due season. He parses out the meat appropriate to their needs at the time that they need it. Now watch this. He goes on to say, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, watch this, when he comes shall find doing so. Christ has just added a blessing to the description of the faithful and wise servant whose ministry is sustained all the way to the coming of Christ. Now, this will correspond to our message tomorrow on the doctrine of faith. Because without faith, it's what? And when we understand biblical faith, we have to understand biblical faith in its duration and in its qualitative nature. So I'll give you just a heads up. Biblical saving faith does not start and then quit in the middle. Biblical saving faith does not start and abort before crossing the finish line. It never does. That would be constituted a false faith. Biblical saving faith endures to the end. This is what Christ warns about. He says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Right? This is why our study in James right now is so germane, not only for our own church, but for folks who are listening. Because I, I know that where people are struggling, is not they're struggling with not analyzing and really thinking through the meaning and nature of faith. So there are two kinds of faith that Christ is going to reject when he comes. A dead faith and a false faith. We'll talk about it tomorrow. He's going to reject a dead faith. Can a dead faith save anyone? And he's going to reject a false faith. The false faith is the faith that puts artificial fruit on the branches and pretend that it's bearing fruit. Only to be condemned in that day for trusting in its works rather than in its root. Got it? You guys got that? So now not watch what he says when it goes on here. He says in verse 47, Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Is that a crazy promise or what? The man that is graced of God to serve in God's kingdom and to be used by God, whose tenure is sustained all the way throughout his assignment, so that when Christ comes again, he will be rewarded for that labor with all that Christ has. Now that's huge, but it's also in total concert with the nature of the gospel promise, because all that Christ has is all that we get. 
Does that make sense? So it's quite natural for him to make these kind of outrageous promises over the little pittance of work that we do in his name by his grace. He said, I'm going to reward you with everything. Well, that's right. Because he was the real ox that labored to tread out the corn. And I get to enter into that blessing by him gracing me to hold out in my tenure till the end. By the way, this was the major impetus. I don't know how I could use this metaphorically um, relative to how God started me off. So if you guys remember how God dealt with you when he first called you by his grace, when God called me by his grace and uh, began to reveal the glory of, of Christ to me and open the scriptures to me, it was at a very, very unstable time in American history, the middle 70s when we were just coming out of the whole Cold War conflict. And, um, and we were dealing both with the Russian threat, the Iranian uh, conflict, and we were dealing with uh, some economic problems in America in terms of inflation and stuff like that under Jimmy Carter, et cetera. Uh, uh, and then we were also dealing with apocalyptic preaching and teaching that was saying the world was going to end in 1988 and the world would end in the 90s. And, the, and so we were dealing with a lot of eschatological drama. And so this is how God takes evil and use it for good. A young, naive brother that has just had a revelation of the glory of God in Christ. And the revelation that saved me was a revelation of Christ coming on a white horse to judge the ungodly. So I met him as judge, not some cute dude with long hair rubbing me on my back saying, there, there's going to be all right. I met a judge that was ready to thrust me through and send me to hell. That was the terror that gripped me when I finally comprehended the centrality of Christ. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? I didn't know what to do with that. I'm 17, 18 years old from the hood, deep in hood stuff. Don't know what to do with this glory that is confronting me with judgment, but bow down and ask God to have mercy on me. Keep me in trembling until somebody lead me to be able to bow to Christ as Savior. That's what that was. And from that day on, what I recall, brethren, was being driven to the Proverbs immediately while working and then driven to the book of Revelation because all the cats that I was listening to and watching were preaching on the book of Revelation. So my head was being filled with the beast with seven heads and seven crowns and ten horns and, and the seas raging and, and locusts coming up out of the pit by the gazillions and men dying and blood everywhere and, and they were misinterpreting the scripture and twisting the scripture and, and making these locusts helicopters that were fighting wars in the Middle East. And, but I was taken in. As a young brother, I was, I was ready to just put on the whole armor and go to war for Christ since it seems like we're getting ready, to, the world getting ready to end. Lord, thank you for saving me just a few years before the world ends. Let me go to war. And it was a good thing that it was that way versus what's going on in our culture today. Because it's casual today. There's no urgency today. In the day that God was working with me, I just felt like right around the corner, nuclear war. Right around the corner, outbreak of the tribulation period. Right around the corner, evil of all kinds. Or Christ could come. Compel me to go deep into the scriptures. Compel me to share the gospel. Compel me to go from church to church to church to church to church to church looking for the truth. Go to this church, sit for a minute, go, ah, that ain't it. Go to the next church, sit for a minute, ah, that ain't it. Go to the next church, ah, that is it. And for a while, for almost five years, I went out into the wilderness. Anybody did any of that? I went to the wilderness. I was done with church because they were playing games. And that's where God started really dealing with me in the wilderness in terms of me taking God's word series. Now, I wasn't being productive because I was out of the church. But God was dealing with me. And once he did five years with me in the wilderness, he said, it's time for you to go back in. When you go back in, sit your butt down and get qualified to actually do ministry. That's what turned the whole thing around for me. By the time I'm 21, 22, 23, I'm actually preaching and teaching in the church now. You understand what I'm getting at? Because that was my passion. That was my drive. I was committed to realizing the kingdom of God, both practically and functionally. 
And these are the kind of texts that were getting at me. Here it is as we go on. He says in verse 48, but, that's our contrasting conjunction, right? But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, are we going back to Proverbs 14? The hypocrite shall, the hypocrite in heart shall be filled with his own ways, right? But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. Do you see that? You notice what he did? He did what the minor prophet said was push the day of the Lord far away from him. Something was going on in his walk that, that, uh, that forced the idea of Christ's return to be uncomfortable and inconvenient with what he was developing in his own life. Are you with me? So he had to give up either the things that he was doing that were incongruent with an any time returning Savior, or he had to push the Savior down the line, as Amos puts it. They put the day of the Lord far, far away from them, saying he is not coming now. Right. Well, that's what Peter said. Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers, everything had been the same, Jesus is not coming. And today you don't even hear the conversation about the return of Christ. Where are you hearing any serious dialogue anywhere in the world about the return of Christ? Any of you guys? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 30, 32 brothers in here. Where, where are you hearing it? Are you hearing it anywhere? You aren't hearing it anywhere, right? Okay, we're talking about it, but I mean, just as a rule, you're not hearing it. And, and I haven't been hearing it for 30 years. So what's going on in the church where our faithful conservative Bible expository teachers are not giving us a healthy diet of the return of Christ as the New Testament lays it out? You can't read epistles where it's not talking about the revelation and coming of Christ. It always is. The tenor of the New Testament is Christ is coming soon. The way Revelation closes is, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Is that right? That's the way the book of Revelation closes. And I'll, I'll give you a caveat on that. That's the combined effort of the husband and wife saying to a lost world, get saved now. Get saved now. The bride and the spirit, the spirit and the bride say, come. And whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely because Christ is coming soon. You guys understand the tenor of what I'm getting at? Now think about the tragedy of this. This salient doctrinal truth absent from your spirit and mine when we are at work. And we're having a conversation with somebody on the job about God. And we don't have an urgency about eternity. Is that going to impact the manner in which we share the word of God? Think about that when we get together with family members who are pontificating businesses and adventures and activities for weeks and years to come. Or the young nephew or the young niece that's talking about college and a career that's extending 20 and 30 years, what does it sound like for us to talk with them absent of this reality? Christ could come at any time. They could die without Christ. And because that component of our teaching doesn't play a role as central as it ought, we don't have the urgency to tell those people that they need to prioritize their lives around the gospel. Is that true? It's just true. It's just true. A lot of times what you and I do is get trapped into debates and discussions around peripheral doctrinal issues that have nothing to do with their soul. Isn't that right? Peripheral doctrinal issues. Making the assumption that they are solidly standing on the ground of the gospel and, and are ready to go whether Christ comes, comes today or they die. So now we're talking about crazy stuff that have nothing to do with essential gospel matters. Now watch this. This is where we're going. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, and here's the manifestation of it, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants. Do you see it? What do you mean by smite the fellow servants? Misuse them. 
abuse them, torment them, persecute them. Ferret that out. Teach a legalistic system of religion that imposes upon them a kind of bondage that defrauds them from the rich grace of God that's in Christ Jesus necessary for them to grow and thrive and mature. They become oppressive as leaders. Do you guys get that? Think about that with me. I thought about this for years. A lack of sensitivity to the return of Christ on the part of leadership will grant them the kind of presumption so as to be arrogantly imposing upon the membership. Because to push Christ's return further than it ought to destroys a sense of accountability. You hear what I'm saying? If the leaders don't feel like they have to answer to Christ ever, then they can behave like they don't have to answer to Christ. But if leadership knows that I can be called to the carpet right now, I could drop down dead in front of you and face Christ right now, I'm accountable to you. I'm accountable to tell you the truth. Because I could drop dead right now and immediately I got to stand before the sovereign Lord. Immediately. You got that? immediately I got to stand before the sovereign Lord. So if I'm pushing that day off, then I can start teaching you all kind of crazy doctrine that would elicit from you a response of either praise or pay, which is what's going on in our churches, right? Listen to the text as we get ready to wrap this part up. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and shall begin to smite the fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. Do you see it? Now he has moved away from the sober ministry of gospel preaching to partying all the time. He's spending all his, he lives to party. This dude has lost his priorities altogether, has he not? He lives to party. If we were to draw this metaphor out into its logical, consistent, uh, uh, re redemptive framework, this is him departing from gospel ministry and engaging in false ministry, false prophets and false teachers who are the drunkards of Ephraim, according to Isaiah chapter 28, that have tables of fellowship that's filled with vomit because they consume all of the goods of the, of the kingdom on their own lusts. Do you guys understand what I'm talking about? This is, this is the rulers who are drunk with their own power and drunk with their own riches and drunk with their own uh, devices and thus they are not discerning rulers because discerning rulers have to be sober spiritually. Sober and giving out the meat in due season at a time in which the people of God need it so that their souls can be strengthened in the cause of the crisis of the gospel. The point being is that ministry is about meeting soul needs instead of acquiring wealth for oneself as a minister. You hear what I'm saying? Right. And it's very tempting when you live in a country like America where you can make that happen. In our Latino churches, our Afri African American churches, largely, you see these little empires of 20 and 30 and 50 people. This dude living large, uh, just, just living like a, an absolute, you know, monarch or king when the congregation are peasants because they have to kind of maintain his absorbent lifestyle. Is that true? All right, very much so. And, and, the, and you know, there are much lesser, more obvious uh, um, uh, attributes in terms of these kind of behaviors but this is what Jesus is saying in our text and I want you to see how it closes out and comports with what I'm talking about the hypocrite is verse 50 and 51 the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he is not looking for him see it does this does this tie to chapter 14 verse 14 a of course the hypocrite will not come before God the hypocrite will not walk in the light. The hypocrite is not looking for God to come. The hypocrite doesn't hold in the vocabulary of his thinking, in the, in the, in the library of his mind, a category where Christ is coming. He, he's not looking for his coming. How do I know he's not looking for his coming? Because he's not coming to God. If he were looking for God's coming, he'd be coming to God. He doesn't want God to come. 
Watch this. The hypocrite hopes that God does not exist. Got it? The hypocrite hopes that God does not exist. And so he acts like it. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he does not look for him and in an hour that he is not aware of, here it is, verse 51, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the what? There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See it? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Go back to Proverbs 14, 14. I just want to quote the last verse, last part of verse 14, and we're going to come back next week and unpack what it means a good man is satisfied from himself. Verse 14. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. The parallel verse is verse 15. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his goings. You guys see that? The prudent man cares about how he lives. All right, let's break into some Q&A, brothers. Let's break into some Q&A. Observations, questions, we got runners. Let's do this. This is fifth inning stuff. This here will prove whether or not you guys are listening passively or you're listening actively. If there was something ex exegetical that came into your mind, let's work this through now. Yeah, so we'll start with e anybody. Anybody, we do this for about 10 minutes and then we shut it down. You have to be able to know that when you're listening to any kind of exposition that you are taking notes, that you are advancing and tracking with that person, and here's a couple ways that you know it. What will happen in sound teaching when you are paying attention is information that you did not know, affirmation of the things that you did already know, all right? And then edification in the sense that you may be corrected or you may be encouraged or you may be rebuked. That's how you know you are actually tracking with the teaching, okay? That's what you always want. You don't ever want to go away from any teaching not getting something out of it. Don't ever do that. Don't ever cut your ears off in the church. Don't ever shut down your brain in the church. Always see if you can grab something that is valid, that is biblical, that is affirming, that is new and edifying or challenging to your soul. If it's challenging, so what? You and I are not the paragon of wisdom. We can wake up on any given day and realize there was a topic or a subject or a word that was brought to me. I got to do some study now. Does that make sense? All right, so go ahead on. Yes. I had an experience just recently uh, with a person that I knew his father. His father was a very good friend of mine. He died a few years back when his sister passed away just a few years ago. And so he, 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 he wanted he wanted to uh, how do you say uh, share his lifestyle with me if you will. Right. Right. So we uh, had breakfast here this week, and he was on and on about how he lives, women, and all this stuff. And I was just praying to God, hey God, I, I, just let me get an opening. Just let me, let me. I just kept my mouth shut, waiting. Of course, for an of course. Opening. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And when it was my turn to talk, I told him how Jesus sees that same thing. Yeah. And it was. Justice number C. I yeah. mean, he was just, he had gotten so far down the road of this lifestyle. This lifestyle, he, 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 the, the gospel just uh, was repulsing him. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It was, and I was just telling him, you know, the way you live in this, you know, that's, you know, your father didn't live that way. I told him how Jesus 
actually came in his father's life. Yeah. We both crossed over, like, not even, like, maybe a couple of years from each other. Sure, you know? sure. And, but the point being is that the whole conversation with Dad, and he didn't want to be with me no more. That's right. But I let him know that that the faith that I was that I was now practicing had actually become my lifestyle. It, it wasn't. I wasn't just going to church. Sure. You know. Sure. I'm living this way. Yeah. <clears throat> and look what has happened to you. That the way the, now the thing you're doing has become your lifestyle. Man. Indeed, that's Proverbs 14, 14 A and B. And so this 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 study is just is so real in our everyday lives, and it's affected a lot of young men, and particularly because they there are a lot of us as young, a lot of young men have they believe in this uh, kind of uh, secular uh, life partners, not marrying, not committed kind of lifestyle, and try to blame it on the state, blame it on the system. Blame it on the culture. I say, I mean, what you really doing? You have war with God. Yeah. Your problem. You have a problem with God. Yeah. Because I believe any commitment that I that I commit myself to, I'm going to take it up with God first. And should I go out on on that on that and on that path, God is going to cover me. Right. I don't have to rely on the state or the, or the or the or the the cultural fashion of the time uh, to be. Uh, the type of thing that will cover what, I, what my decision is going to be. You know, the decision that I will make towards living a life is going to be it, it, it's going to be the way God would have me to do that. You know what I'm saying? So, as opposed to, because you know, a lot of people believe that, well, I'm not going to get married because you know, a marriage won't work in this type, in this, in, in this, in, in this state. But now you've got ten girlfriends. Four or five baby mamas, that type of thing going on. That's right. You have war with God. A hypocrite is filled with his own ways. That's right. Our next brother, uh, Phil. You can put it to your mouth. There you go. Anybody else? Raise your hand if you guys want to contribute to the dialogue and discussion. Go on, Phil. Yeah, Pastor, I have, uh, it has to do with our faith. Mm -hmm. um, I like the difference you even explained this between a false and dead faith versus a weak Evil faith. Mm -hmm. the, well, propositionally, the distinction is rooted right there. So let's say that a person has a weak and feeble faith, uh, but it's authentic. Well, it's just weak and feeble. Uh, but let's say a person has a false faith. Well, they actually do not have true faith at all. They just have an appearance of works that give them a justifying position to assert that they have a faith, but their works really don't correspond to saving faith, which is what we're gonna teach on Sunday. It would, it would actually amount to Matthew chapter seven, around verse 21, when they say, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out devils? Have we, we not done miracles? Have we not done many mighty works in your name? Well, those are not the works of faith. You got that? You got that, brother? Those are not the works of faith. Those are superficial ornaments that you put on the Christmas tree that makes it look like it's bearing fruit and it glitters and it shines and it impresses, but it has no root. You got that? False faith designs its own kind of works that is not ontologically connected with the faith itself that works. A dead faith has no intention of producing or presenting any kind of works at all because it's hiding behind the superficial facade of mere justification apart from the subsequent sanctification that leads to the fruit of union with Christ. Does that follow? Just like that. So the two that will be rejected on that day is the ornament uh, laden tree 
that has no life on it at all. Jesus said, I don't even know you. There was nothing there in the root. You understand? You, you're impressing men, but this has nothing to do with saving faith. Are you guys with me? So you guys get this, you'll get it a little bit tomorrow. Saving faith bears fruit and doesn't talk about it. Saving faith will conform to the will of God in every area in which gospel ministry is calling it. Are you with me? And doesn't talk about it. It just does it. And then on that day when Christ comes, he's the one that pulls up all that was done and says, you did this, you did that, you did that, you did that. And saving faith says, when did I do that? Got it? Because the attitude of those who possess saving faith, while they practice those things that correspond to saving faith, their joy is in the one who saved them by faith. Got that? That's going to be the big difference as we work it through. That's going to be the big difference as we work it through. Um, weak faith. Weak faith. If you've been trekking with us in our Friday Bible study. Still glorifies God. We were in Acts chapter 19 two weeks ago. And Paul is preaching in the area and arena of, of, of Ephesus and folks are sick and just the shadow of Paul is all they needed to get hope from God. Paul took one of his aprons that he used as a carpenter and cut it up in shreds and the disciples took the apron shreds and gave them to sick folk and sick folk are just thankful to God to be able to be in contact with God through the mediatorial work of Paul and healing takes place through the shreds of the garments. Now that's weak faith. That's weak faith. Do you understand that? That's weak faith. That's borderline superstition. That's borderline paganism. But our faith can be that weak. Is that true, gentlemen? And God still blessed it. Those folk were getting healed at the thought that God would smile on them through the apostle who wasn't there, but his shirt was there. Weak faith is far more powerful than dead faith. And far more powerful than no faith at all. Does that help, Brother Phil? Yeah, yeah. Don't confound weak faith with dead faith. The other side of your, now what, what those of us who are weak in our faith should accept is that Christ would admonish us for being weak in faith. So, so this is where we return again to the position of sonship and accept the chastening of the Lord. Is that right, gentlemen? Because when we sustain a weak faith, there are areas in our life that are impeded by powerful strongholds of unbelief that don't allow us to thrive and allow our faith to grow when God wants our faith to grow. So, he rebuked the disciples frequently for being weak in faith, didn't he? Frequently. But he didn't reject them. They still graduated. Didn't they graduate? Weak in faith, still graduated. Give me weak faith any day versus no faith or false faith. Um, uh, uh, then we'll get, get with Big D. Go ahead on. So um, the, uh, the Proverbs 11, 9, um, I, was, I was struggling with um, being a hypocrite who might be destroying his neighbor sometimes, whether it be family members with, you know, your your fleshly zeal to want to get someone saved as opposed to uh, doing it in love. And so having been accused of doing that before with my family members, that Proverbs 9 just 
11, 9 is a slave and a hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge the righteous will be delivered. Yeah. I just thought of that that knowledge being um, you know, going back into Romans 12, 2, uh, being transformed in your mind by uh, by the renewing of your mind by his word, not being conformed to the world or being a hypocrite. Um, so that was an observation that uh, I take away. And then um, the uh, reflection that you made um, in, uh, in, Re in Revelations, um, which I was listening to uh, um, Brother Art Arturo Azurzi, I think is. Uh, Azurdia. Yeah, Azurdia. Yeah, and he was uh, talking about, um, he captured that thought about. Most churches are not preaching the return of Christ. They're preaching being saved, which is important. But what we need to keep in mind is that Christ is returning yeah. as we're being saved. He's returning. He could be coming back tonight. We don't know that. And so our churches should be um, teaching that return of Christ and that, that vivid picture, that white horse coming, picturing him coming, and, uh, and we want to be ready. We want to be found being able to finish. Yeah. So that was a, a great takeaway, and I'm very thankful to be in a, in a gospel teaching and preaching church that would you know, ex, expound that uh, to us so that we can just be filleted by God's word and, uh, and be thankful for being filleted as opposed to a heart being hardened and saying that's not uh, a reflection of me. Amen. It certainly is. Amen. In verse 9, I'm going to share with you how to work verse 9 as a therapeutic rebuke. This is very, uh, very important. So verse 9 says, a hypocrite, a hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. Anytime we are hypocritical and we open our mouth, we are inclined to destroy. You guys got that? Anytime that we are hypocritical and open our mouth, we're inclined to destroy because we are saying and doing not. Um, as we are pursuing maturity, that's why I opened up with you guys on this matter of the tongue because James chapter 3 verse 1 and 2 is underscoring this is how we determine our maturity is how we control our tongue. You know this in the physical dimension when we were teenagers and our hormones were, were raging, the thing that kept us in trouble is our mouth. It did me. And the mystery was, why did I open my mouth and say that again? Well, I was immature. If any man bridles his tongue, the same as a mature man. Now, I'm trying to give us the impetus for maturity at grace so that we can see the fruit of that maturity in the larger scope of the field that God has given us individually. Because sometimes we're dealing with the mixed fruit of carelessness in one area and carefulness in another area and I want to be more careful than careless do you guys understand that so so that's where we want to to mature now when I discover that I have been careless you know what delivers me part V of that part B of that next verse but through knowledge and that knowledge is the knowledge of the atoning work of Christ that's able to cleanse me from all unrighteousness and to do what was done for Isaiah, send the coals, the hot burning coals of his grace and mercy from heaven and purge my tongue of the iniquity and the perversity that would be there and so qualify me to rise up after the purging of that iniquity and start sharing the gospel afresh with men and women tomorrow. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus that walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. For the law of the spirit of life has liber liberated me from or delivered me from the law of sin and death, which is in my members, right? So the law of sin and death would keep me condemned. The law of the spirit of life would drive me to the cross where I appeal for grace and cleansing and walk away from that thing determined not to do it again. There is forgiveness with you, O oh God, that you might be feared. 
Am I making some sense there? So that latter line is for that same person that the former line is. Because we're both that person. The hypocrite one day, the just the same day. Just because we exercise a practice of hypocrisy doesn't take away our standing as just. Is that good, T? Of course, I may be taking some liberties with that, but I'm doing that by way of exhortation. I fit both hats. I wear the white hat and the black hat sometimes. And I'm shooting at myself, and I'm going to war at myself, and I'm praying the white hat wins that day. Next observation, Big D. Yeah, that doesn't answer my question. I was, I enjoyed your message Sunday. I, I didn't, I wasn't here, but I looked at it live. Okay, and okay, I enjoyed it. good. And, um, but I was, someone called me this week, and I was getting ready to read my Bible. And they said, what you doing? So I said, I was getting ready to read my Bible. So immediately I said, do you read your Bible? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, I don't know the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, when's the last time you read it? I said, when's, where is it? She said, well, I'm, I just moved, and it's, you know, I got to get, unpack it. So I said, when did you move? She said, two years ago. I said, two years ago? Said, two years? I said, I gave you a Bible. And so I began to talk to her about, you know, living right. Mm -hmm. But as I was doing that, I was saying to myself, David, you don't read your Bible like you should. Right. <laughs> and so I was telling her, hey, but I'm talking to you, I'm talking to me too, though. That's right. That. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I said, because I need to read mine more. Right. And then what came to me is be quick to hear yeah. and slow to speak. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, I would say this to that, which is important. You didn't do anything wrong in your exhortation for her to read her Bible. It would have been wrong if your heart was wrong. Understand this is a heart matter. So you actually were quick to hear because you modify in the process of exhorting her what we call in our evangelism tactic principle, the we factor. Rather than standing outside of the pit, you climb inside the pit and go we. We need to read more of our Bible, right? This is called the simpatico we talked about last night. When you are sharing the word with people, enter into the we. We need to do this, we need to do that. We need to do a better job. And that allows them to recognize that you are not free from the fault of the very thing that you are exhorting. Does that make sense, brother? Absolutely. Very important. Very important. Although I'm glad you got an application out of this word. Who, 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 who's next? Okay, go, go on, my brother. What's your name, Les? Jonathan. Jonathan, you guys, that's brother Jonathan. He's been visiting with us for a few weeks trying to get a little extra word on the side. Him and his, well, him and his two brothers that come along, came along today, too. What's going on, Jonathan? Uh, first, I just want to uh, thank the pastor and the, uh, the men here this evening. Um, I thank God for the fellowship that we have. And the observation um, is what I've Listen to this evening has reaffirmed that wise man that God has awakened in me mm -hmm. by giving me his spirit. Mm -hmm. um, like all of us here, I'm sure we've all dealt with uh, times where we want to speak up, but we've been hit and restrained, uh, restrained and um, the, the words just don't come out. Mm -hmm. And then we reflect when we're back at home or back in our own you know, environment where why didn't I say anything? And this has been something that I've been struggling with lately for the past couple of weeks. And am I really safe? Yeah. I remember catching your message on that. But just reflecting on that lets me know and assures me that if Christ is keeping me at a humble state in my life, that he's continued to teach me things and prepare me for these times and these uh, situations that I find myself being quiet in. And just hearing you um, affirm the wise man and, and what the characteristics of being a wise man is, is being steadfast, working diligently, but these are all characteristics that the Spirit is bringing out. Yes, us. yes. So, um, I just, I thank God that at those times he's kept me quiet. Mm -hmm. Because he's kept me quiet for a reason. Mm -hmm. And the reason could have been me saying something so foolish that it would just been sprinkling out seeds that are going to hinder somebody else. Great, great. The probability of that possibility is extremely high. 
And he's good to us when he does not allow us to be so forward that we open our mouths in folly. This is great. Great observation, David. My brother? Hey, Pastor. Quick question. Mm -hmm. I was just a friend, since we're talking about this, a friend asked me a little while ago about uh, John 15 uh, with the body and the bone dresser. And I don't believe uh, you lose our salvation, but the question that was asked to me was dealing with every branch in you that, 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 that does not bear fruit. So it was dealing with in you the process as in we are already saved, but we also can be uh, cast out. Um, I don't know how to really properly answer that. Mm -hmm. It does seem like we're already in, but then at some point we are, we're out. Right. Um, so. Yeah. Actually, that's what I'm going to be preaching on next week, John 15, because we're tandem, we're, we're doing tandem teaching out of the book of James. So I'm going to close out James 2 this week, and then I'm going to James 15 next week, because what we're talking about is maturity in Christ. So what we, are, what we teach as we lay down the gospel principles of maturity is the relationship between the root and the fruit. And the parable of the vine tree is the seventh and premier parable that Christ uses to underscore his identity as the mediator between God and the people of God. He says, I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. His last I am in a metaphorical context in John's gospel is I am the true vine. Because that metaphor is going to lead to him going to the garden of Gethsemane, suffering, and then dying, okay? <clears throat> As he makes his way to the garden, he will do that great, great uh, work of John 17, that high priestly prayer. But John 15's gospel is the final metaphor or parable of Christ's I am for God and for the people. And when you deal with the parable of the vine, the true vine, you are dealing with a corporate construct of Christ as the central source of the kingdom's existence under the vine metaphor. And under that vine metaphor, it allows for the appearance of those who are connected to the vine authentically, but prove not to be. Because the secret mystery of the union is not rooted in them appearing to be a branch, but the water source that runs up through the trunk and the stalk and nurtures the branch so that it bears fruit which is the third person. So in the metaphor, so you guys are getting a little bit of it here, you have the father who is the husbandman. He does the pruning. You have Christ as the vine. You have the branches as the professing believers. Who is the conspicuous person missing? The third person. Because the parables are always designed to ask an individual, are you authentic? Are you genuine? Because if you're not genuine and not authentic, you don't care when you're not genuine and authentic about the secret mystery that actually sustains the believer's life, which is the third person. Are y'all with me so far? Yeah. See, when you're not saved, all you care about is what you appear to be. That's why as we're dealing with faith, James is saying, there's a bunch of y'all talking about, I'm saved by faith, but I don't have to evidence anything. I, my profession is cool. He's superficial. Because what he is doing by stating that all I have to do is believe, I don't have to bear any fruit, I don't have to manifest any works, is to deny the glory of God in Christ and the grace that comes with Christ to actually produce fruit in people's lives. It really is militating against the work of Christ. Are you guys understanding what I'm saying? So here's where we battle around people around the gospel, period. When we say that we are something that we are not, we are impugning God. So the vine tree metaphor says 
Just as in the field, you're going to have wheat and tares. Just as in the dragnet of the kingdom, you're going to bring in good and bad fish. Just as in the sowing of the seed, you're going to sow on good soil, on shallow ground, stony ground, and then good ground. All of those metaphors describe the kingdom and that which bears fruit and that which doesn't. And the consistent rule is everything that's good bears fruit. And what Christ is teaching in the parable of the vine tree is this. For the disciples, they would be able to not only know as they do ministry, what would constitute true saving grace in the lives of those to whom they would minister, but they would also know that those who are not truly saved in the process of God's providence, they would be cut off from the vine tree. In other words, the vine tree is going to cut off everything that's false. My husband men will cut it down. Are you following me so far? My husband men will see to it. So the vines on the vine tree often represent denominations. Not just individual Christians, but denominations. So throughout the history of the church since the days of Christ, you had the Acts Church, which was non-denominational, and then it moved into the Catholic Church, which was non-denominational. Then it broke into the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church. Now we're dealing with denominations. And throughout that whole movement, guess what was happening since the days of the apostles to the Roman Catholic Church? Christ was snipping off vines that didn't bear fruit. How do we know? Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Going back to Art's exhortation, I am on my way. So what did Christ say in Revelation 2 and 3? Repent or else I will come quickly and cut you off. He was cutting off churches. He was cutting off assemblies that really were not rooted in the gospel, really were not rooted in Christ, and were not operating by the power of the Spirit of God, which brings us into legitimate union with God through Christ, so that Christ is doing what Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 through 11 says, producing the fruits of righteousness in us. Pull up Philippians 1, 9 and 10. Watch how this works. I just want you to see it. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. We're going to go through verse 9 and 11. This here is a passage that you want to grasp. Here it is. I pray this, that your love may what? See, again, we have this constant exhortation to increase and grow, right? No static categories in the kingdom. Always organic, always vibrant, always growing. I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in what? Knowledge? And in what? Judgment. That's discernment. That Greek word is discernment. Your, your love will grow in knowledge. You want to grow in the knowledge of the gospel and you want to grow in discernment to make right decisions. Now watch what it says in verse 10. Here it is. That you may approve the things that are what? So here is what we're saying. As men and women continue in the word of God, as they become sounder and more acutely able to rightly divide the word of God with hearts that are hungering for greater communion with Christ, they will grow in their discernment. They will learn what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. They'll know those things that please God and they'll know those things that don't please God. They will be able to approve that which is what? Excellent. Now watch what it goes on to say. That you may be sincere and without offense. You see those two words, sincere and without offense? The word sincere is equivalent to our word hypocrite that you may be without hypocrisy. That word is a Greek term that refers to the clay wax that is used as a substitute on the marble icon or the marble sculpture that breaks or is fractured because something happens to that marble. What they would do is they would make up a clay wax that you can use to fill in, shave off when it dries, and paint over it so that your marble statue looks like it's a whole marble statue, but in fact, it's filled with clay dough, like the bondo we used to use when we were fixing old cars. And so what Paul is saying is, live in such a way that you don't actually amount to a hypocrite. Now what, what that verse is going to call you to is real-time relationship with Christ at the level of authentic confession so that you don't put up with bondo. 
You don't want Bondo lifestyles. You don't want pockets of your lifestyle that's covered over with Bondo. We want the real material. We want the real marble. And if, I don't, if I'm not able to acquire the real marble by a sincere relationship with Christ, then shave, shave my idol life down. Shave it down to just a ball. Make me an apple in the kingdom. I don't have to be some great big old ornate thing. Just don't mix, with me, mix me with a bunch of bondo so that Christ has to throw me away as useless because I was being hypocritical. Through it. Am I making some sense? Be sincere. And without offense. So being without offense there corresponds to the sincerity. If you and I are building monuments that are fundamentally hypocritical in nature, um, we're going to be offensive to both God and man. Because people are going to read us through and go, this dude ain't real. This dude's not real. And, and, and as a consequence, we're going to offend men and we're going to offend God. Because God has given us everything necessary to not have to be hypocritical. Now, we may not ever achieve full potential in our life depending on how lazy we are. But we can even be authentic about that. I don't have to settle for the bondo of covering up the fact that I'm lazy. I can just say, man, I'm lazy. That's a bondo-free confession that, that's much more acceptable in the sight of God because it's sincere. And they say, man, why are you lazy, man? Well, I, I'm not making excuses. I'm just lazy. I know I need to get this right. And there are resources to make that happen. And I have to pursue God by prayer and, uh, and, and whatever resources I need to to overcome my slothfulness because slothfulness always leads to poverty. Does that make sense, brother? All right, we're almost done. Look here. It says, until the day of Christ, that we are what we want to be without offense, offense till the day of Christ. Here's the verse I want you to get now, verse 11. Here it is. Boom. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. Do you get the picture? Who's producing the fruit? Do you see it? And he's doing that because he wants his father glorified. So I'll share with you an insight question about the branch. And because this is going to be the one proposition that I'm going to lay out in that study. There's one thing in that parable of the vine tree. There's one thing, one thing and one thing only the believer is being called to do in that text. One thing. Who knows what that is? Abide. There's only one imperative in that whole illustration. One imperative. Now an imperative is instruction. It's where God tells you what to do. The rest of it is glorious indicatives about what the Father is doing and what the Son is doing and what the Holy Spirit is doing. If there is no water source for the roots, of that vine tree, there will be no fruit. Christ says one thing, and that's what we're going to work on next week, the implications of abiding. Did you guys got that? That's the one responsibility the believer has. And this is what Christ has been driving home since chapter 8. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That theme runs all the way through chapter 18. Got it? That's your key. So the reason a branch gets cut off is not because it was saved and then got lost. It made a profession of faith and identified with the kingdom, like going to church and learning doctrine, and yet there was no real authentic union between them and Christ, and so eventually it bore no fruit, and over time the Father cut it off. And that's why you see people walk away from the church. And you guys are young. So what that means is that um, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, your heart is going to grieve. Do you hear me? It's going to grieve. It's going to grieve over people you never thought would have walked away from the faith, would have abandoned the faith. 
but will indeed abandon the faith. It will break your heart that the scriptures are so accurate and so precise and so right. And there's nothing you can do about it. In fact, the passive position of prominence in that text on the part of Christ, which is an insightful, humbling thing to you and me is, he never takes responsibility to do something that would appear to usurp the authority of his father's providence. Christ never did that. Christ never came off as if, I will save you. I will protect you. I will keep you. I will guard you. He never did that. He never owned us coming to him. He always acknowledged that that was the father's work. My goodness, that man's coming to me. That's something the father is doing. And then he would say, but those of you who don't come to me, it's it's because my father's not drawing you. And if you don't bear fruit, my father's going to cut you off. Christ is not protecting anyone from the responsibility of them as a professing believer, making sure that they are in union with the son. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? And he gives them the ultimate impetus in verse 8 when he says, now herein is my father glorified. I'm, just, I'm letting you know the reason why I came is to glorify my father. I'm calling you to glorify my father. Now here is how my father's glorified. I'm warning you now. Powerful prophecy to 12 men one of which was being cut off while he spoke. Right? Right as he was speaking, one of them was being cut off. And he knew it. He knew he was a, tr a branch in the vine that was not connected to the Father or the Son by the Spirit. And he bore the superficial fruit of signs and wonders, which is never the fruit of saving faith. Did you guys get what I just stated? It was the false fruit of signs and wonders, not the authentic fruit of saving faith. Let's stand for prayer, brother, so we can get out of here and get tomorrow. I've got a lot of work to do. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for our, our brotherhood. We thank you for the young men that have come out tonight. For our brothers that are watching, we, we bless you. We encourage you. Uh, we, we would definitely encourage you to strive in the scriptures, especially in these dark days, to keep going deeper with God and asking him to take your root down so he can bear fruit upwards. And remember, we can do nothing of ourselves without Christ. It's impossible. And yet through him, all things that he has purposed for us can be done. As we go our way, we ask for traveling mercies, prepare our hearts to worship tomorrow as you ought to be worshiped. Oh God, we pray in Jesus name. Amen.